bridge the gap between those who are looking for God and may not find Him uh, readily available or accessible uh, because of difficulties, tragedies, uh, hurt, pain, etc. And we believe that this is a wonderful day to tell a little bit of the kind of emotions and real feelings that many of us may feel uh, when unexpected things happen. How many of you know we all have a lot of unexpected things that happen in our life? Resurrection Sunday is a great reminder that death does not have the final say. If you were in uh, service this morning, you would have heard Pastor Donna preach a message that, amen, Donna, no, she just was on fire, amen. And she reminded us, that what, if, what if we lived our lives in such a way where we really believe that death died? because of the resurrection of Jesus. And this is such a fascinating just thought. Um, we know that resurrection is such an important, uh, not only reality, but also a story that continues to be told over and over again in our lives. And uh, did a little, try to be a little cute, and did a little play on this series that is playing on TV. But we wanted to ask a couple questions. What would you do if someone you had lost returned? And what kind of emotions would you have? What kind of real human questions and, 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 and uh, uh, thoughts and inquiries would you have? We wanted to spend our service today answering those with the backdrop of the promise of resurrection. So today we're gonna, uh, you're going to hear from a number of some of our uh, you know, pastor preachers and teachers here at The Way. We're going to have some drama and some special music. But all of it is geared to help us wrestle through some of these emotions and challenges that all of us face on a day-to-day -day basis with the awareness that death does not have the final say, that the worst thing that's happened in your life does not have to define you, and that indeed we have the power to be people who are indicative of a risen Savior. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him I'm glad he's alive. I'm glad he's alive. So to start this off today, we are thankful because we have so many different kinds of folks here in our congregation. We're going to have some of our superstars. When you see Berkeley, they're going to come and start us off with a skit that just kind of tells a little bit of the story of a, of a particular passage in the scripture. Uh, many times Jesus did indeed uh, uh, give folks a preview of what his resurrection would be like by performing miracles. And we have this adaptation, all you biblical literists, I'm telling you, it won't uh, be exactly the same, but all of you that don't know nothing about the Bible, have no fear, because you won't know the difference anyway, amen? <laughs> but I, I hope the message will bless you the same. Come on, put your hands together for our eyes. It was a Tuesday. I was 12 years old. It was a normal day. We were eating breakfast and all of a sudden, all of a sudden I felt he got faint. He was burning up and then clammy and I don't really remember. It all happened so fast. I just got so sick. Something was wrong. We called the doctor and he came out and it was so bad. He said, he said, he said it was really bad. God, it was bad. He said it was really bad and he probably, the doctor said that I probably wouldn't get any better. I mean, what do you do? There had to be something. My dad was trying to figure out what to do. And I guess he heard of this guy named Jesus. He heard about it from the other pastor or something. And supposedly, supposedly he can heal people. I had heard Jesus can heal people. I had heard he can heal people. So I ran to the middle of town. He was there. I ran up and I was looking for him, you know. I'd heard things and I was so sick. My dad ran out looking for Jesus. Guess hoping he could do something. I wanted him to do something. Jesus, I need you at my house. My son, please, can you just come fast? He said, please, come to the house right away. It felt like forever. I had been sick for, I don't know, 12 years. He said, my son. Please help us. Come fast. So maybe I can get better. Maybe I'll stop if I could just... If he could just come to my house, I thought, you know, he could do something. He could just make me touch. I just kept getting hotter and sicker. He could just touch his clothes. Just the edge of his 
start? Maybe that'll be enough, and no one will know it. And then Jesus stopped. He just stopped. We were going in. And it was. He just stopped. stopped. It just stopped. stopped. My heart stopped. stopped. The bleeding, it stopped. Twelve years stopped. He stopped in the road. Jesus said, who touched you? Who touched you? There were hundreds of people around him, and he's asking, who touched me? He said, I felt it. Who touched me? I was afraid. Oh, God. What if? I didn't want anyone to see, to know. I just thought I could. I thought we could go to my house, to my son. I thought I could just touch. Who's not touching you? I did it. I touched you. What? I touched you and it stopped. This sick, dirty woman came up and said, I touched you. And they stood there talking about it all. And then they said word. He was dead. It stopped and I could. My son's dead. Have a life? I couldn't hear the words. I remember his exact words. He said. Jesus was talking. He said. Daughter, your faith has rescued you. You had a chance to save him. Go in peace, he said. You could have rescued my little boy. They planned a funeral. But you didn't, and he's dead. And he continued down the road. My son's dead. I get back to life. My son. It was over. I had a son. He's dead. I came to you for help with my son. And now what are you going to do? Jesus came anyway. What are you going to do for a dead boy? I'm well. How do your faith has made you well? He insisted, so we went. We got there and they were getting the funeral together. There are people downstairs with food. I thought about all the people I'd missed and all the life I hadn't been around for. He walked right into the middle of the whole thing and said, he's not dead. I could get back to life or something. He said, he's just asleep. People laughed. He was dead. My old friends didn't even recognize me. They knew I was dead. They knew. They didn't know who I was. You mean I was cold and gray? He took us up to his room. He was so still and cold. He was. I mean, I was. I was never there. Life happened without me. He was. He wasn't there. He didn't know what to do, seeing me. Jesus came to the room and said some stuff. He told us he's asleep and we're going to wake him up. I don't really know what happened, but, well, I do know this, I just remember feeling so, so cold, it was so cold and dark, and then I just felt warm air come over my face, and I heard someone, Jesus stood over him, just like it was morning and said, little boy, get up. Get up, little boy. Get up. Because of him. And I opened my eyes. And it was him. It was him. It was him. My dad had Jesus for about 15 minutes. My mother <laughs> cried. It was him, my son, awake, alive. It was Jesus. He made me well. I was better. He told us to get him something to eat. Back to life. So they're downstairs with all the funeral food. We took all the food the people had brought in. I wanted to throw a party or something. Instead of having a wake, we had a party. We had a party. The best party. A party for my son I who's could, alive. I could have a life. A life. Amen, amen.
We thank God for those gifts in this place and for their willingness to come and, and share. We've been talking about intimacy as we lead up to today and um, as we're looking at the resurrection, we divided up some text. I'm going to take the first part of it. I'm going to talk just for a, a brief few moments about intimacy and pain. Um, some of you may have your Bibles. If not, it should be posted on the wall if you can see it. Just going to look at three verses. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 11. It reads as follows. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive, and he had been seen by her, they did not believe. Trauma is defined as a violently inflicted psychological wound with lasting effects. Now I want you to imagine for a moment that the person in your life that you love the most, the person who has stuck with you through thick and thin, a person who believed that you could when you thought you couldn't, a person who has supported you and walked with you, a person who has done things that have changed your life. I want you to envision that per person in your mind right now, and I want you to think about all the good things they've done for so many people, and now I want you to imagine that this person is dragged through the middle of the city, beaten so brutally that it tears jagged rips to their flesh. They're taken up a hill and they're hung by their wrists, by nails, nailed between their wrists and between their bones and their feet. And they suffer there hour after hour after hour after hour after hour after hour. The stress of hanging there becomes so intense that the capillaries in their sweat glands burst and they begin to bleed sweat. And you're saying, oh, is this, when is it going to end? You want to take them down, but you can't. And you see them die there. Trauma. A violently inflicted psychological wound with lasting effects. You witness that and you will be traumatized. And so you leave that place and you're mourning and you're grieving and you're dealing with trauma and then a friend comes in where you are. You can't even really make sense of what you've seen or understand why it has happened. But a friend comes in and they say that the person you love the most, the person you saw die before your eyes is alive. What do you say? Is this a trick? Is it a cruel trick? Are you kidding me? barely get my mind around the fact that I saw this person beaten and hung on the cross and now you're telling me that they're alive no I don't I don't believe that I can't handle more than what I'm handling right now pain has a tendency to create resistance to the very thing it needs to heal what person who has lost someone dear to them wouldn't want to hear that that person is alive and has been seen? It's the one thing we want to hear when we're grieving the most, but the pain of that moment will make us resist. Our lives are not that much different. How many of you have tried to help an injured child and they fight you because they're afraid that if you touch their wound, it's going to make it hurt worse. Right? How many of you have actually been in a place where you haven't dealt with a cut properly and it gets a little infected? And you know that in order for it to heal, you got to open that wound back up and dig a little deeper. It's going to hurt a little worse. So what do you do? You fight the very thing that could heal you. Now, if we look at Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene had been possessed by not one, not two, not three, but seven demons. Jesus had healed her. Her life before encountering Jesus had been very traumatic. 
filled with pain and grief. Imagine being used her body for sexual gratification. Imagine what her life was like, where she lived day in and day out. She had been traumatized in her life, but then she meets Jesus. Jesus heals her and she follows him. She spends time with him. She enters into an intimate relationship with him. So by the time she encounters Jesus at this resurrection moment, she has, she has a new perspective of what healing means because she has spent some real time with Jesus. Now, granted, she was given a little extra help. She went to the tomb and was told by the angel, you know, he's been risen. She had a few minutes to figure it out before Jesus appeared to her, but still, just a few minutes to get it. I can't help but to believe that this relationship that she had with Jesus, this place of being able to open herself to him in her most vulnerable moment, to say, I am willing to hurt a little more in order to be healed. I can't help but to think that that journey with him allowed her to accept this reality of being quicker. And so the question becomes, what areas of pain in our life are keeping us from being in intimate relationship with God because we're afraid if we take that step, it might hurt us a little more. And what, who among us may be here that has taken that step, but you pull back because God began to do some work and it did begin to hurt. He began to open that wound a little more. And so we retreated. All I can say is that the answer may be found in this story, and I'm going to take my seat. When I was about four years old, I fell off my bike, and I skinned my knee. My mama took me into the bathroom, and she set me on the counter, and I saw her open the medicine cabinet, and she pulled out some antiseptic spray. I saw that can. My Lord. You talk about hollering and screaming and crying. No. retreated, she pulled back, she calmed me down, and she says, now Donna, I need you to listen to me. She says, now I'm going to spray this on your cut. She says, and it is going to stay worse for just a moment. She says, but when I spray it, I'm going to start blowing it, and it's going to make it better. She says, and it's only going to last for a few seconds, and I promise you, after it stops stinging, you won't even feel the hurt that you feel now. And then she looked at me and she says, can you be a big girl and can you trust mommy? <laughs> now, I was still scared <laughs> and very uncertain, but my mama was so sure yeah. that this would stop my pain that I said, okay, mom. And she was exactly right. It stole like, boom, God have mercy. <laughs> when she first sprayed it, but it was only for a few seconds and then the hurt that I was feeling before she even sprayed it was gone. The question that I leave with you is are you willing to hurt, risk hurting a little more for the sake to heal and be an intimate relationship? There's that up.
skepticism and doubt. So turn with me in your Bibles or certainly up on the screen. Luke chapter 24 verses 9 through 11. Jesus had just been risen and as Donna is kind of wonderfully articulated Mary Magdalene and all the women were there. And I think they knew that they need to tell the sisters before they tell the brothers. Amen. <laughs> the sisters may be a little bit more open to things that we can't explain. Verse number nine says, returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and to all of the rest. And now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women who went to them and told their apostles. And verse number 11 is where I will pull all of these uh, points, at least for this next few moments. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe it. How many of you have things that have happened in your life or things that you know are inevitable to happen? And even with a whole lot of preparation, you still find yourself surprised when it happens. Some things that we can be prepped for, and then there are other things that we can't be prepped for. The Warriors winning a playoff game. <laughs> Something we can never be prepared for. The 49ers not winning the Super Bowl. Something I can never be prepared for. The Raiders winning again. Oh, never mind. Something with advance notice we can never be prepared for, even when we know it's inevitable. The loss of a loved one. The failing of your health. The transitions that take place with your employment. The struggles or even the disillusion of your relationship. The betrayal of family and friends. Or just even the knowledge that life is filled with hardship and the difficulty of dealing with the reality of having to go through. When I look at these passages, clearly the disciples were struggling with disappointment, grief, despair, and many other human emotions. Their natural reaction, listen to this, to the greatest possible news that would reverse their epic struggle was not met with joy or celebration, but it was met with great skepticism, incredulity, and dismissiveness. They believed it was an idle tale, and they could not believe. Even though Jesus tried to prepare them, got a few days ago, he told them, oh, you know, gather them, fill them up with a whole lot of food and wine. Told them I'm going away and I'm going to come back. Three days 
days, four days before this, told them everything that was going to happen, but when the moment came, they were overwhelmed by their disbelief, their doubt, and their skepticism. And here is one gift of resurrection because it humanizes the disciples by putting them face to face with some of the same emotions many of us feel every day when it comes to faith, when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to the church. Somebody say amen. 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 ourselves. We can be a bunch of skeptical folk. For many of us, life has been so hard that we close ourselves off from the possibility of the unexplainable. Modernity, reinforced by the Enlightenment and a certain kind of fundamentalism, has caused many of us to only believe what we can explain. Only be moved by what we can control and domesticate. We create these nice boxes and we try to fit everything in our lives into these nice boxes, yet we find out that any box we create is never big enough to hold the reality and the truth of who we really are. If we're honest, we would admit there are times we were by ourselves, away from our mama and them and our boo and all the other homies, we were hoping for something bigger than us who can save us and give us an explanation. And it is in this way I find the ultimate gift of resurrection in that, listen, your mummy is not a prerequisite for your resurrection. Uh, Scott. Scott. Even though the disciples and all of them didn't believe it was Jesus, how many know Jesus still got up? <laughs> Jesus was going to do what Jesus was going to do whether folks believed him or not. Because that's just who he is. Resurrection is all a God thing. Right. And the gift of resurrection is that we get to all of us, we get to be worn down by the weight of the power of resurrection. Meaning that Resurrection has the ability to wear you out until you believe. It can go beyond our power, our, our mindset. We heard a song where they said our God is so big. The weight of resurrection is an ability. It's transformed in reality. can work in our lives in such a way that it goes beyond our comprehension. Beyond our full understanding. It is so deep. It is so wide. Listen, that it can hold every part of us. Yeah. Even our doubts, yeah. our skepticism, our fears, our pains, and our disappointments. Resurrection is big enough. Right. Yeah. Jesus is big enough to handle yeah. your skepticism. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And listen to this. He's big enough to handle it and still be the greatest source of your hope. Right. He can never handle all of our doubts and still be the source of our eternal salvation. Now, skeptics and doubters have always been a part of the story of Jesus from his birth. How many of you know folks were skeptical? Yeah. Teenage, pregnant girl. Delivers the baby and he's the Messiah of the world? <laughs> right. <laughs> Skeptics. His parents. Joseph? Really? Really, Joseph? Really? His cousin, John the Baptist, the one who left in the womb, came He said, is Jesus the one? Or should we look for somebody else? Because I like my head where it is. <laughs> Skeptics have always been a part of the story of Jesus, even through the resurrection. 
And Jesus' response to them is His consistent response to us. He gives us the space and the grace to find faith and eventually be surprised by joy. Resurrection forces all of us to deal with the natural and very human tendency to ask questions about those things we cannot explain or fully understand, but not be disqualified by our skepticism or belief. Now make no mistake, Jesus is on to something when he tells the last holdout, the most skeptical doubter of the group, Thomas, listen, Thomas is blessed to, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Jesus is on to something when he said, it's better for you to believe it, even when you don't see it. But I tend to think that the blessing has a great deal of the kind of offering, not that God gets any benefit out of you believing Remember, God's going to do what God's going to do whether you believe or not. But the great blessing of believing and not yet seeing is the way we live our lives in light of belief. That I will every day live with an awareness of God's ability to raise some things back to life. Let's be clear, our life and our faith will be characterized by many conversion moments. I have a lot of moments in our life that need to be converted. But I got any witnesses in here today. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I need to be saved again and again. And again. <laughs> any more again in here, right? Right? But Carl Bart, I like the way he says it, that doubt is the confirmation of faith. Meaning that doubt springs from the soil of failed or unmet expectations. Doubt is only possible because we have this belief that something should happen. And with many experiences we've had, how many know there's a lot of reasons for us to doubt? The credibility of the messengers. Somebody holler skeptical. The believability of the message. Somebody holler, I'm a doubter. Likelihood it will happen. Somebody holler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fear of being dis disappointed or let down. But my brother and my sister, if those reasons were the end of your story, I would encourage you to never believe in anything you can't explain. I think I have a few witnesses that can testify today that somehow, some way, resurrection keeps happening. So what do you do with your skepticism? What do you do with your doubt, your incredulity towards your life, towards the message of faith in Jesus, the reality of resurrection? You do what everyone else who has had a genuine encounter with God has had to do. You lean into it. You face it head on. And be ready to be surprised by the joy of resurrection. You guys can just keep playing. Most of these preaching well, sounds a little better than you got music behind you. It makes you feel like you're doing a lot more than what you are. <laughs> and I need all that help after preaching after them two amazing preachers. Let's give them a, a round of applause. <laughs> if you didn't know, now you do know that that was my wife that was up here um, singing. <laughs> But if you got your Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 9. And, and I'm just going to uh, piggyback off of what was already been preached. Uh, and, and really, Donna, you know, I told her about what I was preaching about initially, you know, when we were sitting in the office a little bit earlier. And, and what happened was, is that she thought, I, was, I really want to preach this right here. And I was like, I don't have enough time to preach this right here. And what she did was she kind of set me up to preach what I want to preach about right here. So, I'm, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read two texts and then I'm going to kind of explain a little bit about it. And then we're going to conclude and, and then uh, Pastor Mike's going to come up here, get people an opportunity to come into a relationship with Jesus. But uh, my response or my thing of what I'm talking about is that's the believer's response. It's a response 
in a sense that what we should have is a response of worship and amazement about when we see people come back from the dead. You know, Matthew chapter 28, verse 9 says, this is just Mary's response as she interacts with Jesus. It says, suddenly, it says, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. You know, how cool is that, that Jesus is just like, hey, what's up, homie, how you doing? And then they come, Mary's like, oh, oh my goodness, it's him, it's you, it's Jesus. And this is her response. It's just she came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And one of the point, first part of what I want you to realize in regards to if we are to have the right response when people come back from the dead is that we need to be in amazement of what God has just done. So many times inside of our lives is that a miracle happened, something that we've been praying for, something that 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 we had, we called everybody and their mama about. We told them about the issue, but the moment that the miracle comes, we all of a sudden get quiet. We all of a sudden get to that spot where we're like, well, you know, I've got to be conservative. I've got to be this. I've got to be that. And I believe in order for us really to really experience the wholeness of the resurrection is that in that moment, we don't just sit back in awe or sit back in amazement thinking about, oh my goodness, I've got to keep to myself. i got to keep my mouth shut. I can't dance. I can't shout. No, what you need to do is just be loud. Yeah. Is you just need to, inside of that moment, grasp on to Jesus. Yeah. It's not something saying that she sat up there and said, hey, what's up, Jesus? How you doing? i got to keep cute because I'm in my Easter dress. No, what she did was this said, she grasped his feet. Yeah. So that means that she got into a place of a position where she got a little bit dirty. Uh -huh. Where she got a little bit messy. Even right now, I'm kind of scared to get on my knees, but I feel like I just need to, to illustrate the point. Is that she grasped onto him. And then in the sense of the picture, we're going to keep on going, is that we'll connect this from Matthew to John, or as we heard from the video, the guy who had the greatest revelation because he wrote the last book or whatever, okay? So here we go in Matthew, in John chapter 20, verse 16 through 17, it says, Jesus said to her, I'm referring to Mary, she said, she turned toward him and cried out, Rabbi, which means teacher. It says, Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, uh, to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Amen. So in other words, we see these two contradicting pictures where it seems to be contradictory. Where her first response is, "Let me hold on to you. Let me worship you." And then we get this picture from John that basically says that John, that Jesus says, "Don't touch me. Let go of me." And I believe that it's not a contradictory statement, but yet it is the next step for us really to understand what our response needs to be when someone comes back to life. Is that we worship inside of the moment, but yet we understand the purpose for the moment. Is that you need to understand that your miracle, your deliverance, and the sense of you being loud and proclaiming it is awesome and it's amazing, and we all need to do that, but we move from the step of just Moving past the moment of, of skepticism and realizing that you're like, yes, I accept 
practice our worship in it. But your worship inside of that moment is to bring play. It is to bring deliverance. It is to bring the salvation into our world. Yes. You know, like you just saw my wonderful wife that was up here. And, whew, I said, oh, I need seven minutes. <laughs> But you see my wife that was up here. Now what if our husband, no, I, I, on the day we got married, I was out. My brother was out. <laughs> Let me repeat. A brother was happy on the day that we got married. Right. Because you look at her and you look at me and you're kind of like, oh my goodness, what did he do? What lies did he say he did her? Singing, we had people, you know, dancing, we had people doing everything you can think of. We had like a Hispanic, whatever else type of wedding, but those, those, those weddings last at least two hours. Okay? We just went there celebrating. But what if we've been married for 12 years? <laughs> what if I still was trying to hold on to the moment when we got married? where I want you to go. And when you reach the place of moving to the place of recognizing this resurrection, recognizing that Jesus was raised from the dead, is that it should move you to not just trying to hold ground to what happened 20 years ago, but it should give you ground for victory to victory to victory to blessing to miracle to insight to life being changed to salvation inside of my family. I'm believing for my cousins. I'm believing for my brother. I'm believing for my sister. I'm believing that this is more than just something that can be contained by these four walls. But I understand that the gospel is not what someone like Jay-Z would say. It's something that ends once we enter outside this door. We go outside this door. No! The gospel was made to blow up this world. So that lives can be and will be transformed. Not by what we say or not necessarily by what we do but by the power of the resurrection. The power of someone we know rising from the dead.